I want to welcome everybody tonight to the uh, Cedar Rapids Community School District Board of Education meeting. It's Monday, March 26, 2018, and with that, I'll call the meeting to order. Would somebody like to uh, read the approval of the agenda? I move that the agenda of Monday, March the 26th, 2018, Board of Education meeting slash work session be approved as set forth, and that each item is considered ready for discussion and or action. Is there a second? Second. Great, and this is a roll call vote. Just so we know, Director Jansen is joining us by phone this evening. Great. So, Director Jansen? Aye. Director Humbles? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. Director Jacobo? Aye. Director Borchardine? Aye. Director Meisterling? Aye. President Laverty? Aye. Great, thank you. Um, next, we'll uh, move into the public hearing phase. So, we have three public hearings tonight, and we will take them all together. There's a public hearing for Washington High School Auditorium ADA project, a public hearing for Washington High School track resurfacing project, and a public hearing for Metro High School ADA compliance project. Laurel, have you received any correspondence about any of these items? I'm receiving correspondence. All right. Is there anybody in the public that would like to address the board about any of these three items during this public hearing time? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the public hearings. With that, next we'll move into uh, Dr. Buck's superintendent report. Great, thanks President Laverty. So our magnet school lottery closed last week and we're thrilled to announce that we have a record number of 345 applicants. Interest was so high that we have families on waiting lists. Initial invitations have been sent to our first round of families who are eligible for the lottery slots. Uh, this is an exciting indication that the interest in magnet schools continues to grow in our district. Congratulations to our magnet school coordinators for their work with coordinating the lottery for admission to Johnson Steam Academy, Kenwood Leadership Academy, and Roosevelt Creative Corridor Business Academy. Our school nurses play an important role in the lives of our students. Congratulations goes out to Sandy Byard, who was named School Nurse Administrator of the Year by the Iowa School Nurse Organization, which supports school nurses in the delivery of health services designed to improve the health and academic success of all children. As a recipient of this award, Sandy's recognized for demonstrating excellence in school nursing practice. We are lucky to have Sandy as part of the CRCSD family. Another staff member deserves some kudos. For the second time in four years, Kennedy High School's vocal music director, Storm Ziegler, is the Allen and Sandra Chapman Outstanding uh, Director Award recipient. This award is presented annually at Show Choir Nationals to an outstanding music educator, there's no doubt that Storm deserves this honor as he runs one of the most prolific vocal music and show choir programs in the country. We deeply value our CRCST staff and their numerous award-winning contributions to our students. Congratulations, Storm. Uh, Roosevelt eighth grade English language arts students are participating in a partnership reading program with the city of Cedar Rapids. Dr. Diane Schnobelin Kramer's students are reading and interpreting novels with their adult reading partners in City Hall. The project allows students to connect with positive role models in the community and get them excited about reading. A $4,000 youth literacy grant from the Dollar General Literacy Foundation paid for a class set of devices to support the program. What a great opportunity to engage our students with community leaders in our vision of every learner future ready. Over spring break, Washington High School instructor James Burke took 20 students and a second chaperone on his seventh annual trip to Guatemala. The trip is in conjunction with the nonprofit organization Imagine in Guatemala. The students work together to build a four small but durable homes for families in need. They stay with host families in Antigua for 10 days and make it well-rounded experience by visiting an orphanage, hiking up a volcano, and participating in a Mayan culture ceremony. Mr. Burke says, in short, it is a great cultural and language opportunity for students but also reaches a profound place of compassion and service that impacts kids greatly. And we take away lessons of simplicity and true happiness from the amazing Guatemalan people. I'd also like to update the board on the progress made in negotiations. It's been clear from the beginning that we've entered this process with an orientation to build an even more collaborative and engaged workforce. In our opening remarks with each association, we stated it is our hope that we proceed with a steadfast devotion to working together with our unions toward a future characterized by inclusivity, transparency, and collaboration. We have remained committed to this goal. 
I'm aware there's a perceived misalignment with our vision of a collaborative workforce supported by the district, a vision embodied in the power of we statement that was launched earlier this year, and what is believed to be occurring in negotiations. Specifically, you may be hearing information related to these negotiations meetings, which publicly characterize the district's negotiation team as not allowing permissive items to be discussed as possible components of contracts. That information and those characterizations are completely false. We have navigated through this process with a willingness to discuss permissive items. In fact, in all of our groups, we've expressed an openness to negotiate permissives. As you know, the law requires the negotiations process to occur behind closed doors. However, it allows for the association to provide updates to its members, while the district is very limited in our ability to provide updates to our staff. We would, in fact, appreciate a public process in which both sides could be heard and all staff would have access to the same information in order to draw their own informed conclusions. We have the utmost desire to collaborate with our root groups. As an example, the negotiations process with the Teamsters is one which transpired as any healthy negotiations process should, with both sides bringing initial proposals to the table and working together with the legislative and fiscal factors at hand to develop an agreement that was best for our employees. This is exactly what we should all want to accomplish, and it required both groups to make compromises that differed from either group's initial offers. We focused together on the big picture and engaged in negotiations which honor success for everyone fueled by a shared vision. This is progressive and it has resulted in a five-year contract, 100% ratification, and while we couldn't do as well as any of us would have liked in terms of money, we settled with the addition of a cash bonus to all in that work group. During negotiations, transportation leadership brought up issues and concerns that are beyond the scope of traditional bargaining, such as our hiring processes. We heard and agree with the concerns, and as a result, a process is underway to assemble a collaborative team to work to resolve these non-contract concerns. And to further demonstrate our desire to reasonably negotiate through this process with all groups, we have expressed a desire to discuss excluded items, like the evaluation process, insurance, and lane changes to support all employees in conversations around these themes. In our opening public remarks, made back in January, we stated that we share a common goal to improve the experiences for all employees. The district leadership team continues to believe in engaging in a process which improves the experiences for all employees, both union and non-union members, and we work toward a future characterized by inclusivity, transparency, and collaboration for the betterment of all staff and all students. Those are my reports. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Buck. At this time, are there uh, any board reports or comments? I do have something to share, and that is that last week I was able to go and volunteer at the Roosevelt Creative Quarter Business Academy. They had their PTA president, Dan Koch, had met Jacob Heideman, who's with the University of Iowa CCAD Research National Advanced Driving Simulator. So I got to help um, some eighth graders have some driving simulations where they texted while driving and mm -hmm. and there were some before and after measurements on drift and swerve and there were many crashes so um, that was a good way for them to learn good hands-on experience for them to learn also how driving in different weather conditions um, is is affects your driving ability to stop and such um, kids really liked it uh, I think it's a great program they have going on at University of Iowa and it is free to any middle and high school should they also want to participate in the driving simulator I have that information so awesome thank you Jennifer other board reports Gary some legislative updates I spent a few days in Des Moines last week um, a couple with the IESB exec board and then I spent a little bit of time on the hill also um, the uh, and educational savings uh, bill was passed out of the Senate Ed Committee and will go to, uh, I haven't checked today, but it, it will go to the, to the full Senate for action. Um, there's, uh, there's some discussion there at uh, IASB that didn't think that it would, would move this year through the House. Um, but, but, <laughs> we'll, 
we, we, we don't know, and they're still at work and so on. And there was a bill introduced earlier in the House that didn't move out of committee. So uh, when I get the final Senate bill, I will forward it to you, and uh, it's something we need to uh, certainly not, I don't believe, IESP doesn't believe it's helpful for public education. Um, the SAVE um, is moving along. Uh, our ISB lobbyists thought that it probably would not go th actually be go through, be approved until towards the very end. Uh, but they're not um, they're feeling very confident that it's going to move. But for one reason or another, it's, it's going to be just kind of held. Testing bill was moved, as we know, moved through both houses into the governor. Uh, I'm sure she'll sign it, I, or if she hasn't already. Um, Pearson will will get the contract, but understanding is Pearson doesn't have a test yet, so we will we will see how that all works out. Is it Pearson that's getting it? W well, I'm sorry, it's uh, University of right, Iowa University testing of Iowa programs. Pearson is the, going to be the distributor of it. University of Iowa, whatever <coughs> testing, doesn't have a, a, at this point, a test that is aligned with the core. So, uh, other than that, it should be a shorter session. Um, <laughs> let's see. Sounds good, Gary. Thank you so much. Other board reports or comments? I have a few items. First, I want to thank everybody in the audience. We, you know, we we do notice uh, you've been here with us, many of you, for the last three board meetings. So, thank you. I know many of uh, in the audience have emailed, and some of your colleagues have emailed friends from the community. And um, I've done my best to try and reply to all of you individually uh, with what I can. So, um, and I know the rest of the board is listening as well. So, thank you for. Uh, for all your comments and support, and we are listening. So with that, I do want to uh, also mention that in addition to Kennedy being at the National Show Choir Competition, the Great Washington Momentum Show Choir was also there as well, and for the second time in many years has won the best band in the country for Show Choir Nationals. So I just have to say I'm a little biased in all of that with the daughter that was in the first time. So. But anyway, congratulations to all of them. That's, it's an awesome experience, and um, that Grand Old Opry is really something for those kids to be on stage, and something they won't ever forget. Um, I'll be at the Capitol actually tomorrow for a whole other thing, but we'll be talking with legislators, so uh, I appreciate the up, update, Gary, and we can talk offline later about some of those things that uh, we can push with them a little bit tomorrow. Um, a few of us, Kristen, Jennifer, and I are going to the National School Board Association conference coming up here uh, that first week or so of April, and we started looking at some of the sessions, amazing uh, sessions from around the country about innovative uh, school design, about using technology in schools for the betterment of students. I, I even saw um, uh, every learner future ready in some of the comments. So. I don't know if, if they're stealing our logos likely. and slogans, likely. but likely, exactly. So anyway, kind of excited about all that, some great sessions it looks like. Um, our next board meeting uh, will be on a Tuesday because of that National School, School Board Association doesn't get over with until a Monday. Um, it will be on Tuesday, April 10th, so just want to make sure everybody has that change on their calendars. For the board, and we've received an invitation from Dr. Ruth White and the Academy for Scholastic and Personal Success. They're having their 12th annual, tri annual tribute on Thursday, May 10th at the Czech and Slovak Museum. It's from 5 to 8 p.m., so let Laurel know if you're interested in attending as part of the school district um, table at that event. Always a, always a great time, and um, looking forward to that. Dr. Buck and myself have been invited to meet with the Gazette editorial board in the next week or so. They're still working out the exact details of that. We'll be there with, uh, along with Mayor Hart, the city council members Todd and Weinacht, Jeff Pomerantz, and the county supervisor Walker to, to discuss the set task force. 
we'll bring you uh, more updates as they become available. So not quite sure exactly everything that they want to discuss with that, but we'll keep you up, up to date on that. And then lastly, as a board, we voted on the MOU with the City of Cedar Rapids for a study committee to discuss our facilities master plan as it relates to the core neighborhoods in the city and soliciting input from key stakeholders of those neighborhoods. So along with Dr. Buck and John Galbraith from the district, I would like to announce that I'm appointing Mary Meisterling, Raphael Jacobo, and Jennifer Borcherding to represent the board at that committee. After speaking with Mayor Hart, we have decided that these will be open meetings to the public. However, I have checked with legal counsel as not to create an issue with the quorum of the board at these meetings I would ask others on the board not to attend beyond those three. We will receive feedback from our representatives on the committee and have multiple discussions at the board table in the coming months. So stay tuned, more details on that to come as the logistics of the study committee kind of pull themselves together. All right, that's all that I have. Um, next, we'll go ahead and move on to communications, delegations, and petitions. Um, for those in the audience, this is a time for the public to address the board. Um, you hopefully have all filled out the green form in advance. Um, I'll, as I call your name, please approach the podium. You can adjust the microphone if you want to get it right up to your mouth. Uh, Laurel Day, the board secretary, will um, time the five minutes. You'll see it on the screen. And this is a time to address the board, uh, give your comments. It, um, however, is not a time for dialogue with the board during this public comment period. So with that, We'll go ahead and start. Um, Chris Gerke. Hello, welcome. Chris Gerke, 822 Augusta Drive, Southeast Cedar Rapids. I, I wore the right shirt on accident tonight, color-wise at least. Um, don't know if that's good or bad for some of you. Um, I'm coming here a little bit off topic, way off topic from anything you guys probably thinking about. The uh, Mount Mercy complex is going they have some work to be done at the uh, Franklin track and the Wash Softball Diamond. And I reviewed the plans uh, for that with uh, Grant Schultz, the AD at Wash, this past week. And there's a lot of concerns that the softball program has with the current plan as it sits from Shive Hattery. Um, we're losing a lot of space for softball at the expense of a pretty nice track facility, but it severely limits the softball program's ability to have uh, hitting practice fields. Um, any kind of restroom access or concession stand access. We lose all of our storage sheds, about 300 square feet of storage. Our field dimensions shrink. Um, we lose our outside storage space for lime, field equipment, tarps, that kind of stuff. And of course, we lose our parking lot. Um, the proposal does include bathrooms and concessions for the track area between the track and, and right field of our diamond, but there's no way for people to get from our field to there without going out to the street and and walking up the, the block. It doesn't really um, help the program that much. The, on, on top of that, I don't know if anyone has actually seen the drawings from Shai Fadi or not, but softball becomes an island that's five feet above everything else around it. So the entire track area, the other softball diamond area, and Tomahawk Park all gets lowered five feet below the level of the current diamond. And immediately after our fence, it's like an immediate 60 degree drop off down to that level for the, for the retention basins. So there's no future room for any kind of expansion. The field as it is right now is pretty well stuffed into the lot it's currently in right up to the street. I spoke with the city of Cedar Rapids this past week and they, their E Avenue plans, they're taking the sidewalk right up to our fence line. So it's gonna be parking, sidewalk, our fence line, 10 feet and then our field. Uh, so we're, the program is crunched in from all four sides with no room for any kind of improvements or to add any facilities for the girls to have a, a high class program. The, my understanding is the district's plan or thoughts is that we're gonna use the Franklin track to then host district track meets. At least that was the impression I got from, 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 from Grant Schultz, right or wrong, I don't, I'm not sure, he seemed a little bit um, out of a, uh, out of the loop on a couple of things going on at the district level, but that kind of proposes a huge parking issue down there. Uh, I don't know. You can hardly hold a soccer game down at Franklin without having a parking issue, much less a, a more than a couple school track meet going on down there. 
the city is going to put in more street parking from E Avenue on E Avenue from the softball diamond down to ninth uh, down to 19th where the entrance to Mount Mercy is going to be, is but that only adds you know 10 30 spots and we we'll lose the parking lot for the the, the softball diamond the city also had concerns that the city park and the drawings I saw were, was moved next to the softball field with no plans for any kind of renovations to the softball fields, backstop netting, or any nets over the playground. The city's concern was, first off, if you guys in the city would be okay with having city-owned park on dis district land, because the district land goes all the way to where the current park is now. It's kind of a weird, a weird shaped piece of land there. Um, if the park's going to stay there, again, it just puts more stuff right up to the program. I mean, that park in the drawings was about five feet away from our fence line. The In the plains, they have the track being rotated about 45 degrees, and it splits the softball freshman practice, softball diamond, whatever you want to call it, that the program plans to use in the future as the programs we're building right now. It puts it on the opposite side over by Regis, uh, which kind of makes it a little bit inconvenient for having any kind of... Um, collaboration between teams there or having a small, you know, scrimmage or round robin to get the teams ready for uh, for, the, for the for the season. I, I've called the district a couple of times, left voicemails with random people. I haven't heard back from any of my phone calls into the district about trying to find out who at the district level can answer questions or point me in the right directions. Who have you called? I've called the, the main line and just said, I've talked to builders and grounds, left voicemails. I asked, I'm, this is what I'm talking about and they put me to some random voicemail box. I got a list of names at, at, at work, but um, it's, I'm getting nowhere. And, you know, the impression from the Wash administration is this is kind of a done deal. And from the memorandum of understanding signed August 14th by you guys, it's, this is, the memorandum was to get collaborative work towards the plan that works for everybody. And right now, those drawings don't work for the softball program. I will uh, ask administration to follow up with you directly. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Jonathan Beers. Mr. Beers. You know, if you uh, just state your name and your address, please. Hi, my name is Jonathan Beers, and my address is. 379 Green Valley Terrace, Southeast, Cedar Rapids. I um, want to thank the board for making time to listen to me and apologize to you all because, again, I'm kind of off topic. I know you guys have some pretty weighty stuff that you're here to represent, but um, I'm here uh, from the perspective of a uh, father who, uh, whose children are homeschooled and wanted to express my concern about an email that was sent out from the superintendent's office recently. Um, just to give a little bit of background, uh, not really a news flash, but I'm sure everybody here can understand that uh, when you homeschool, it involves significant personal expense. Um, not only do we spend a lot of money on curriculum and supplies, um, that's actually really a drop in the bucket. Um, the main personal expense is that my wife doesn't earn any money outside the home, um, and so that's obviously a substantial investment that we're making on our part in order to do schooling the way that we think is appropriate for our children. I'm not saying any of that because I'm asking for pity. We, you know, obviously we know what we're getting into and we decide to homeschool and we understand the investment that's required to do it that way. Um, but with that said, I've, for many years, I've asked my legislators to consider um, various measures that might help to defray the cost of homeschooling by basically kicking back some of the money that we pay into the public system uh, and using that to defray some of the expense that we incur uh, as a homeschool family, which I think is reasonable because as it is, we basically pay for school twice and we impose no burden on the public system. Uh, and based on standardized test scores that my children have received, we're doing a better job than they might otherwise be getting in the public school system. So I think all around, it's a pretty good outcome for everyone. And I think it's reasonable to think that we should have some offsetting financial benefit um, in light of those facts. Um, but with that said, I was um, dismayed to see that the superintendent recently sent out an email um, pretty widely distributed in which he opposed uh, a bill that was referenced earlier um, by Director, sorry. Ann Holt. Um, the, the bill was the Education Savings Account Bill, which um, is still moving through the legislature. 
It would provide some funding for homeschool families along the lines of what I was saying. Unfortunately, the superintendent uh, advocated against that bill. Um, from what I can see, the email that he sent out appears to be in contravention of the school district's own policies, which says that political campaign material, including material supporting or opposing candidates or ballot issues, shall not be distributed in school buildings during the school day and shall not be placed in dis district staff members' mailboxes. That same uh, section of your policy goes on to say, the district shall not expend any district funds for partisan political activities. Um, Dr. Buck was gracious enough to discuss this with me briefly offline. And I understand that there are some technical reasons why he believes that his email was, um, was not um, violating that section of the policy. Be that as it may, I think it's clear from the spirit of what was written there that um, you know, the intention of laws like that or policies like that is to avoid taxing people and then using their taxes to advocate for public policy positions that they don't support which I believe is what has happened in this instance. I pay taxes into this system. I support the public school system through my taxes, and those resources are being used to oppose a legislative measure that I support. Furthermore, aside from those legal issues, which by the way, there are also state and federal um, laws that are in keeping with the same principle that public resources shouldn't be used to advocate for or against any legislative proposal, um, Hatch Act being one of them, you know, you can go on, there's state codes, I can cite them. Um, but anyway, besides that, you know, I believe that the superintendent is aware that his responsibility is to ensure a quality education not only for students enrolled in the public system, but also for homeschool students. My students are subject to um, his authority, his direction, his leadership, just as much as any student enrolled in the public system. And his responsibility is to advocate for quality education for my children just as much as any child in the public system. But by sending out the email that his office sent out, he's pitted public school students against homeschool students and made it a competition for resources between the two. And he's gone beyond that. He's taken a side on behalf of kids in public schools. So I would like to respectfully ask that the board consider uh, rescinding that position and directing the superintendent to repudiate the email that was sent out on January 31st. Excuse me, Mr. Thank Beers, you for your time. Up. Thank you. Mr. Beers, we appreciate your comments. Next we have Christina Langton. Christina, hi, welcome. Hi, I'm Christina Langton, uh, 4530 Coventry Lane, Northeast Cedar Rapids. And I am a K-12 alum of CRCSD and now a teacher at Kennedy High School. And I'm here to talk to you tonight on behalf of a colleague of mine, um, Leah Howard, about contract negotiations. Leah writes, hello, my name is Leah Howard and I am a resident of Cedar Rapids and a teacher at Kennedy High School. I've written you all about this issue previously and I am again urging you to show support for your teachers and other employees by offering them a full legally binding contract with all permissive items included, not a weekend handbook. Though I firmly believe all permissive items are important and worthy of inclusion in a contract, today I would like to make a personal appeal and explain how one such permissive item has benefited me greatly and that is leave time. For 13 years, I have poured my heart and soul into my job because I love my students and I love what I do as a high school language arts teacher. There have been countless days that I have come to work sick, injured, or exhausted because it is times easier to come in and do the job well myself than to call in and prepare for a substitute. But thanks to the legally binding contract language, that leave time has always been there when I needed it. Last fall, just after the school year began, my husband and I were learned learned that we were expecting our first child in late May. We were overjoyed, and it was good timing too as I had only had to take about a week and a half of leave, and then I would have summer vacation to care for our newborn child. Well, at least that was the plan. In December, however, we learned that our baby girl had spina bifida, and I would need to undergo fetal surgery to repair that birth defect at only 24 weeks along, and spend the rest of my pregnancy on modified bed rest in Rochester, Minnesota, near Mayo Clinic. When I qualified for surgery, I had four weeks to prepare my life, my home, and my classroom for my absence. I anxiously prepared for a long-term sub, worried about how my students would do, and I prepared myself emotionally to say goodbye three months early. 
It was a stressful four weeks, but I did not have to stress about leave time. I didn't have to worry about losing my job or my pay because I've been a valued, loyal, and hardworking CRCSD employee for 13 years with a legally binding contract. I had enough leave time built up to cover the time that I needed and to focus on healing and the development of a healthy baby girl despite her birth defect. And I am grateful for this time that I was given. Today, I'm 30 weeks along and six weeks post-op. Things are calm and stable right now, and we're hoping to make it to a scheduled C-section at 37 weeks. My plan is to return to Kennedy and resume teaching in the fall. Because I am on leave and modified bed rest three hours away, I cannot sign a petition in person. I cannot wear my blue t-shirt or come to the board meetings and speak in solidarity with my colleagues. But I am with them in spirit, and I can write, though, so I have. I have heard back from Dr. Buck and from Mr. Laverty. Thank you. You've both assured me that the district is bargaining in good faith, and I can appreciate that. However, the unions and the district have bargained over and agreed upon these permissive items in good faith for 40 years. They have only made teachers like me and other employees stronger and feel more valued and supported in their work every day. Please do not abandon these items or weaken them by placing them in a non-legally binding handbook now. Thank you for your support. Leah Howard, Cedar Rapids resident and Kennedy High School language arts teacher. Thank you very much. We appreciate those comments. Next, next we have uh, Janet Schroeder. Is it Janet or Jeanette? It's Janet. Jeanette, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to win, win, am I? So, sorry. My name is Jeanette Schroeder. I live at 5533 Skyline Drive, Northwest. I teach at Harding Middle School and am proud to have served the Cedar Rapids schools for the last 22 years at both the middle school and elementary levels. I want to thank the current board and past boards for their support of contract language that encourage teachers to continually develop and improve as professionals. Today, I am a highly qualified educator because of that contract language. In my 22 years, there has only been one year where I have not taken outside additional courses, either during the summer or school year. I became a teacher because I wanted to make a difference in the lives of students. I had seen my mom, a teacher for close to 40 years, make that kind of impact. I knew that there were other career options that would have allowed me to make more money more quickly, but that money would not have brought me the reward that developing relationships with students and families was going to give me. I had six years of experience in parochial schools before being lucky enough to be hired at Erskine Elementary in 1996. I am forever grateful for the mentoring that I received while teaching in both the parochial and public systems. Several of my mentors were influential in helping me understand that there were ways to earn more money in our district with additional education. At that time, part of our district's mission statement included the importance of developing lifelong learners. I took that mission to heart and started taking additional classes and eventually earned a master's degree in teaching. It was a hardship to be away from my young children and to pay for my master's degree, but I knew that in the long run, it would pay off with a raise in my salary. With that master's degree, I learned many techniques that helped me improve as a pro professional especially in teaching reading and engaging students in the learning process. I continued to take additional professional development courses and started taking on a variety of leadership roles in addition to my teaching in the classroom. The courses that I have taken have covered a wide variety of topics, from standards-based grading and formative assessments to content-specific coursework and changing racial disparities in the classroom. I decided to investigate becoming national board certified and took the plunge the year that I started teaching at Coolidge Elementary. I would have never pursued that if there was not a financial incentive in our contract that was going to reward me if successful. I'm proud to say that I became a national board certified teacher in the area of middle childhood generalist. This professional development was the most personally challenging and rigorous process I've ever experienced. I continue to be a very reflective teacher because of it. I have since successfully recertified as a nationally board certified teacher. 
While I would have continued to grow as a teacher over the past 22 years without getting my additional training and certifications, I can unequivocally say that it would not have happened at the same level without the financial incentives from the contract in place. I would have had a more difficult time taking away time from my family if there were no financial incentives to do so. I am sharing my story with you because I have recently started to question whether my professional development is valued in our district. I am a better teacher because of the historical partnership with the district in my professional development. I am a well-paid teacher. I have not abused the system that was in place, but I have benefited from it. Having a contract with financial incentives for, for professional development has allowed me to be a lifelong learner. I have been blessed to work with the teachers in Cedar Rapids that were dedicated professionals who went above and beyond the basic expectations to meet the needs of all students. As a lifelong learner, I continually strive to improve my practice to best meet the needs of the district and of the students that we all serve. I urge you to keep those financial incentives for, for professional development in our contract. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next we have Ann Van Eaton Janey. Did I get that right? Close? My name is Ann Van Etten Janey. I live at 2801 Teresa Drive Southwest. I'm a language arts teacher at Metro High School, and this is my 16th year of teaching. All of those have proudly been in Cedar Rapids schools. I want to begin by expressing thanks. Thank you for listening to our voices over these past days and weeks. Thank you for understanding the positive impact of respecting and empowering employees by retaining permissive subjects and collective bargaining agreements and how that positively impacts our students and their families. Thank you for the work that has been done and thank you in advance for the work ahead of us in regards to our contracts. Like so many of my colleagues, I love teaching. I love being with my students. I feel complete and fulfilled as an individual because of the work I get to do with my students and their families within our community. But I'm worried. I'm worried greatly about the current atmosphere surrounding public education, especially as the very public arguments are filled with harmful untruths and myths. And even more so, when the myths surround the idea that strong collective bargaining and meaningful contracts are somehow a barrier to schools functioning successfully in both a fiscal and academic sense, and even worse, that those contracts that honor the work of teachers are just protecting money-hungry educators bullied into believing this is the best from their unions. As the authors of the book, You Can't Fire the Bad Ones, and 18 other myths about teachers, teachers unions, and public education suggest. The negative impact of perpetuating these myths about contracts and negotiations that empower teachers are not just bad for teachers, but ultimately for students, their families, and our community. The authors say, quote, one insidious toll is the undermining of public confidence in teachers and schools. The myth encourages a split between teachers and families, falsely casting teachers as standing in opposition to the interests of children and communities when in reality, their interests largely overlap." End quote. Thank you for seeing and understanding that our intentions as we push forward are still ultimately in the interests of our students and schools as we advocate for ourselves and our students. Thank you for not taking part in perpetuating these harmful myths and untruths. Thank you for seeing this causal relationship that sometimes others interpret as teachers just looking out for themselves and their salaries. Thank you for understanding that listening to our voices helps to minimize the catastrophic divide and remember that we really do have a common goal, the kids. The authors go on to discuss the importance of listening to teachers as they advocate, just as we are advocating now, to re retain a strong contract. 
The authors remind us that, quote, after all, good working conditions are in fact good teaching conditions, and good teaching conditions allow for the creation of better learning conditions. The road to good working conditions includes the wisdom of teachers, end quote. Thank you for understanding and appreciating that these many voices are sharing with you years of work dedicated to intense study, research, and learning that goes into the collective wisdom about what is good for us, which inherently is best for our students. Thank you for being dedicated to doing what our students need. Thank you for seeing the importance of working toward a contract that respects and empowers teachers and makes a promise to students and their families that we'll work to do everything we can to fulfill that promise to them. Thank you. We have Joyce Lucas. I don't think I got that one wrong, did I? Okay, good. All right. Welcome. Well, I want to thank all of you as board members for all that you do. Uh, you do a great deal, and you're very important in this process. Um, my name is Joyce Lucas, and I live at 1401 B Avenue in Benton, Iowa. I am a retired Cedar Rapids School District employee of 24 plus years. And I'm here in support of all the public employees and the permissives. Uh, the permissives in the contract, I believe, are important. During my career as a custodian, I was going to school for electronics. And uh, to achieve that degree, the permissives of hours, vacation, holidays, leaves of absence, all of those things were very important to be able to, be, to achieve that goal. Several contracts were negotiated in good faith and agreed upon by both sides, which serves as a guideline. I have seen and read several contract agreements between the Cedar Rapids School District and public employees of the custodial and maintenance department that as far back as the 1930s. Um, in those contracts were what we call permissives now. All of those things were there for everybody to see and count on. The signing of uh, the collective bargaining chapter 20 happened in, in 1974 by Governor Ray, which still is quite some time ago to have them changed now. The permissives help maintain good employees that we all want and need working for our children. And I hope that the school board will maintain the current legal permissives in the contract that were important during my career. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, Renee Greenlee. Renee? Hello, welcome. I'm Renee Greenlee and I live at 4350 Woodsmill Drive Northeast, Cedar Rapids. Um, I am here to respectfully and strongly suggest means of significantly improving the safety of our schools. I am very hopeful and confident that gum reform will happen, but I'm also realistic when considering the amount of time it will take for real change to happen. Even if assault rifles are banned and gun laws become stricter, it could feasibly take a generation for things to get completely ironed out. This is the reason I'm making a plea to the school district to make the safety of our students and staff your primary focus above any other issues and changes you may be considering and implementing. Without intending to sound alarmist, absolutely nothing else would matter if any one of our students or staff dies in an active shooter situation or any violent episode. Therefore, I have some suggestions that are both proactive and reactive in nature. I'll begin with some proactive um, suggestions. Um, I suggest limited entrances for students to come into the school and manning these entrances with school staff who can best recognize an out of place person. Um, I've noticed that multiple doors are often unlocked or propped open before school, um, at the middle and high schools anyway, um, before, before school activities. Um, I suggest that all visitors should be 
screened by being seen on camera, giving their full name, relationship to the student, and the reason for their visit. Visitors should be required to call prior to coming to the school so that the reason can be corroborated. Consider um, banning backpacks and use trappers instead. Um, some suggestions to implement this might be increased passing time to exchange materials between classes. Um, a lot for this may be by shortening smart time and homerooms slightly. Provide handouts and worksheets electronically so binders are not required. Provide in-class copies of books and allow students to keep their own copy at home and when textbooks become obsolete, replace with ebooks. And the, the banning of the backpacks just um, so that weapons can't come into the school as easily. Um, provide an anonymous way for students to alert staff to concerning social media comments or concerns of threatening behavior and actions. Make every staff member of each school aware of suspended and expelled students at their respective schools by providing a picture and a name. Um, and possibly consider implementing a badge system for school entry for students and staff. Um, if the badge is forgotten, then they need to enter an individual code, perhaps. Um, a couple of reactive means um, could be door stoppers that would be utilized in lockdown situations. Um, one of those is um, the just in case. Um, you can find that at dominatesafety.com or the guardian angel at angelonwatch.com. Um, and another suggestion would be panic buttons strategically placed throughout schools to instantly alert law enforcement. Respectfully, I believe the burden of student and staff safety is on the school district. I am requesting that you put aside discussion of other non-urgent issues and focus your attention and time on safety improvement. I am very hopeful that you will implement several proactive and reactive changes by the start of next school year. I also request that you make parents and guardians aware of the changes that are made over the next several months um, to prove that you are taking the safety of our children and staff seriously. It is an issue that can no longer be simply discussed, but actually acted on. Um, and while I'm here too, um, I was a uh, um, staff in the school district for a long time and um, seeing so many of you here, I just wanna thank you for everything you do to keep our children safe every day. Thank you. Thank you. So you, you have children in the district I right do. now? I do, yep, okay. I have a high school or middle I'm going school to ask in. Dr. Buck just to follow up with you because we do have a safety committee oh, that's great. getting underway. So you may that have some wonderful. ideas to share with him on that as well. Sounds so great. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and lastly, um, Michelle Fry. Michelle, hello, welcome. Hi, I'm Michelle Fry. I live at 425 Liberty Drive, Southeast, Cedar Rapids. I have um, had four children go through the public school system. I have been a language arts teacher at Kennedy since 1999, after we moved from Washington, D.C. And uh, we were kind of, it was suggested that we talk about positive things tonight, as to not rile the board and the people with the contracts and whatnot. So um, several revisions later, here's what I have to say that is, I think, a really positive thing that has happened. Um, my comments are for all the teachers in this district who give their time to support students outside of the contract day. So basically every teacher, um, all of you, we know, right? Teachers must come in early and stay late because there just isn't enough time during the day to get the planning and assessing done. Um, we're actually busy teaching during that time, so the other things have to wait. Um, but I will rant about that another time. Actually, I think I did in my emails to all of you, but I haven't heard back from any of you, so maybe you can get back to me on that. Um, so I'd like to share with you the making of um, the local March for Our Lives rally that took place on Saturday in the snow and the wind and the cold. Um, I'd like to recognize and thank Liz Deegan from Jefferson. I don't even know her. I wouldn't be able to pick her out from a lineup. Um, I just know her through email. Um, she reached out a few days after the Parkland massacre because she had students interested in organizing a local event. And did I know any students who would be interested in helping? I did. In an email to me, she was, of course, very humble about her involvement. She said, 
and I'm quoting her here, the decisions regarding when, where, and how to promote the event came entirely from the students. She wants everyone to know that Reagan helped cover some of the costs required to secure a permit and that her building's admin was 100% supportive with Associate Principal Lori Bateman and Facilitator Mike Panock, Panock and family attending the rally this past snowy Saturday. Uh, Emma Lassen from Jefferson spoke about the need to feel safe in school. Washington's Walker Oaks talked about classmates dying because of accidental shootings. Kennedy's Samantha Bennett reminded us that we need to stay angry. And Lynn Mars, Kevin Dreho spoke about steps we can take to enact change. Emma, Bree Kenny, Kat Cummings, and Sherry Sir from Jefferson sang. The crowd chanted and a train happened to go by at an unfortunate time blaring its horn. Um, but the crowd just used that as a sign of support. You know. um, the students felt compelled to speak their truths. As I reflect, the students and community members who braved the elements on Saturday to support the March for Our Lives cause are not that much different than the teachers and CR, CSD staff who are coming to these school board meetings, emailing and asking for a sign that we are valued. Students are speaking up about their lives. We are speaking up about our livelihoods. Thank you. I appreciate all the comments and uh, those that uh, we've asked administration to follow up with. Uh, we will certainly do that. And uh, apologies if I haven't gotten back to everyone yet. I, I'm trying my best to uh, keep up with emails at work and through this. So anyway, thank you. Um, and I do invite you all to stay because we have a lot of other exciting, wonderful things going on in the district. and. We'd love you to hear about them and uh, give us feedback after you hear about that. So next, uh, we move on to the consent agenda. Um, as presented, are there any items in the consent agenda the board would like to pull for further discussion or comment? All right, seeing none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as written? Second. Second. And this is a roll call vote due to the personnel report. Director Humbles. Aye. Director Anhalt. Aye. Director Jacobo. Aye. Director Borchardine. Aye. Director Meisterlein. Aye. Director Jansen. Aye. President Laverty. Aye. All right, thank you. Next we'll move into uh, the administration section. Uh, this is approval of publication for scheduling of a public hearing for fiscal year 2018-19 budget and I will turn it over to Steve Graham. Thank you, President Laverty, Board of Education, Dr. Buck. Um, hard to believe this is my 21st time doing this <laughs> and I'm gonna miss it. I honestly gonna miss it. So fiscal 19 budget is before us today and um, this is the first of two touch points that we'll have, one here in March on the 26th, and once again on April the 10th, when we actually ask the board to certify the budget for fiscal 19. So let's see, am I having clicker issues here or what? Thank you, Justin. Maybe, Justin, you can just run that and I'll just say flip the slide. And at any rate, uh, fiscal 19 uh, budget. All right, we've got two annual budget processes that we run through, and the certified budget is the one we're talking about tonight. It's really all about making sure that we bring the revenue in according to the, the school funding formula. We know the legislature has enacted a 1% allowable growth in SSA and additional $5 per pupil, and all these things will come into the revenue side of the equation with the certified budget component. The line item budget is where the detail of the expenditures follows, and we'll have that real nice uh, three ring binder. It used to be a three ring binder, now it's posted on the web. Everything is electronic, and our uh, uh, taxpayers and our stakeholders can go online and look at all of our budget documents for the last five or six years online. So tonight we're asking the board to consider action to publish our certified budget 
and schedule a pub public hearing, which would take place on the 10th of April. So right now, at this point, we have preliminary total district revenues, that's all the funds combined together, of north of $273 million. And we have uh, estimated district expenditures of $269 million uh, at this point. So this, these are aggregate numbers that will be continually refined through the line item budget process as we move forward. But this is what we look at today. So we have a, a published tax rate of $15.06, which is significantly lower than the $15.30 rate that we have in play right now, which we've had in play for the last three years. And this is a real critical piece to frame appropriately. Why would we be dropping the tax levy rate when the district's fiscal uh, pressures are the pressures that we have been experiencing as of late with a very paltry 1% allowable growth rate in SSA. And the reality is that levy rate drops because of nearly a 6% gain in the local property tax base. It's simple mathematics. If we are limited to 1% growth in our spending level in the general fund and we see a 6% gain in the local property tax base, the levy rate will drop. It's as simple as that. Uh, I think that's A, I think part A of the, of the framing. Part B is this. We simply can't raise a tax high enough to spend ourselves uh, to raise revenues, to provide for resources, to spend and provide for the things that we hear so much today from our teachers, who we very much respect for the wonderful work that you do, as well as all of our other employees who certainly deserve wage increases. But we cannot raise a tax and provide for a spending increase in wages or anything else. We are limited simply by spending authority because of the per pupil allocations that we are remanded to fit within. It's just that simple. Uh, so at any rate, it is a benefit for our taxpayers to see a lower levy rate for sure, 31 cents lower than we've had in the most recent years. And you can see the, the trends here of what we've had for levy rates in the three previous years, and now we're dropping to $15.06 on the levy rate. Uh, you can see where we were in fiscal 10 that jumped to fiscal 11. The reason for that was we had significant uh, reductions across the board. That was our 10% across the board reduction from Governor Culver, where we had significant cuts in our state aid revenues, and we had to levy our local property taxes a subsequent year and 11 to make up for those. And that is the reason why such a big jump. And you can see this is our cash reserve levy the same history, you can see the same bump between fiscal 10 and fiscal 11, and we will be levying uh, proposed 9.74 million in fiscal 19, and for some perspective that you can see, we're limited to uh, $22.5 million of, of cash reserve levy in fiscal 19, so we are well within the limitation uh, statute authority that we have for the school district. Right now, for fiscal 18, we're the third largest levying district in Lynn County of the 11 schools. And these rates are adjusted for the income surtax. Some schools don't have an income surtax. For example, Linmar does, does not have any uh, income surtax, nor does College Community, and we do. So you can see we've got this levy rate that is adjusted for that surtax that we do receive, and it still puts us at the third lowest taxing entity school, public school in Lynn County, which is a good thing. Uh, property valuation trends, you can see the robust growth in our tax base, and you can see that that is a, it's a solid thing. It's very economic vitality in our community, and uh, it's good. It's good for all of us to see a, a tax base growth in that manner. So these are the two most important metrics that we have in the general fund, the gold bars are spending authority, and those green bars are the cash balances of the general fund, the ending fund balance. And you can see, since fiscal 15, we've trended up strongly uh, through the end of fiscal 18. And you can see a bit of a dip down in fiscal 19, but that is based upon uh, the CFO's use of a very conservative estimate of, of uh, expenses that could easily be less than what we have in this trend line at the end of the day. But what we do is we publish high, 
so that a year from now we have a, a budget publication at the highest level that we are reasonably possible to, to publish for our budget, if that makes any sense. Um, the spending authority, the, that bar is the um, maximum amount of ending fund balance that we can spend. So you can see that we nearly have, well, over double the amount of ending cash balance that we actually don't have statutory authority to spend at the end of the day. Hopefully this is a concept that is, is understandable. And this is the very same thing on a percentage basis. Our goal as a board has been to be between 5 and 10 percent on both our spending authority reserves and our cash reserves. And you can see now we've, we were there and we're there for three consecutive years, including what we believe to be the case for fiscal 19. So we're very rock solid. We really are in a really good fiscal position in the school district. So what are the next steps? We continue monitoring what's going on at state legislature. We have high hopes for a save extension. We've got a facility master plan that is really looking for that extension. Uh, we've got the board who has given wonderful support for the framework and we would love to get that started. Uh, ongoing review of our district budget for other adjustments will be in play over the next several months as we approach June the 30th. Uh, so what we're asking you to do tonight is to approve the published budget and to a set a public hearing for the 10th of April for the community to uh, give us feedback on the budget for fiscal 19. So uh, those are my comments. Any questions for Steve about, about this information? All right, with that, we do need to have a, uh, oh, Gary, I'm sorry. Thinking about this, and I don't know if it's, it uh, if it to this topic or not but what about the state is I'm we're hearing that they're doing away with the the backfill on on lo local property tax and it, I, I'm hearing it has more effect on the city uh, will have more of an effect on the city as they um, as they do away with it was promised to to be extended for a period of time, and now they're kind of reneging on that. Does that have any effect on? So they're backing off the commercial industrial rebate for uh, for uh, they're still providing the the discount to the property the commercial industrial property owners. But what they're doing is they're not providing the public entities who are losing those dollars if the state doesn't continue to fund them at 100 percent. And because it's become an expensive proposition for the state to continue funding those, they're ratcheting down the amount that they're providing as a reimbursement level for public entities. So we will see a drop in cash as a, as a, as a result of that, but we will not see any change in spending authority. So what we can do is what we have been doing in the past is adjust the cash reserve levy to make up for the backfill that we should be receiving while not having any impact on spending authority. Does that make sense? It does. Thank okay. you for the clarity. Any other questions? All right. So this will be a voice vote to approve the publication scheduling of the public hearing for fiscal year 2018-19 budget to be held on April 10th. All of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, the same. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Next, we'll move on to the approval of the publication scheduling of a public hearing for fiscal year 2017-18 budget amendment. So, Steve, back to you. This is very routine. We do this every year. We take before you the request for an amendment, and you'll see on the pertinent facts there is a, there's a box chart that shows the anticipated fiscal 18 actual expenditures at the end of the day. That's the focal point of this exhibit, not the amended publication numbers, which are a little inflated so that our auditors are happy and that we don't exceed our published budget. It's as simple as that. Where we believe we're going to land at the end of the day is in the anticipated fiscal 18 column. You can see that in front of you. So. Uh, this is routine. We're asking the board to consider approving the amended budget for publication scheduling of a public meeting on the 10th of April. Any questions about the amended budget for 2017-18? All right, seeing none, this again is a voice vote. All those in favor of approving the publication scheduling of a public hearing for fiscal year 2017-18 budget amendment signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Thank you, Steve. I, I've, just re I've been here for now over half of your tenure and some even more, so we'll, uh, we'll definitely miss you and appreciate all your work on this, Steve. Thank you. Next, we'll move into uh, Human Resources. BA 18291 is the 2018-19 Terms and Conditions of Employment for Local 230, 238 Chauffeurs, Teamsters, and Helpers with Transportation and Linda Noggle, uh, any any comments or any anything that you want to add to this? I really just want to thank the transportation team and the negotiation team for the hard work and the focus and the positivity as we worked through that process. We really had a great collaboration, and um, at the end of the day, I think we ended in a place that we were all happy with. So, very pleased with the uh, outcomes of that negotiation. Great. And at this time, are there any questions from the board? Gary? Yes, I see in our, in our agenda we have the pertinent facts. Could we get a copy of the total contract? Mm -hmm. sure. Other questions or comments? Okay, this will be a roll call vote for the 2018-19 Terms and Conditions of Employment for Local 238 chauffeurs, teamsters, and helpers in transportation. Director Jacobo? Aye. Director Borstein? Aye. Director Meisterling? Aye. Director Jansen? Aye. Director <coughs> Humbles? Aye. Director Anhalt? Aye. President Laverty? Aye. Thank you very much, and thanks, thank you to uh, all of our transportation department workers and Linda and your team and their team for working together on that contract. We appreciate that. Next is the exciting part, I think, is moving into the work session. We've been talking about this amazing possibility and where we're going with this for a number of years. So I know a lot of us are very excited about this. This is the district technology plan. And uh, Lori Bruzek, I'll turn it over to you. Directors, we're very excited to be here tonight to present our technology plan. Presenting with me tonight is Noreen Bush, Associate Superintendent, and Committee Representatives Nick Duffy, Principal at Jackson Elementary, Michelle Cruzy, Media Specialist at Roosevelt, and Lori Mead, Gear Up Coordinator at Kennedy. As we develop this plan, we uh, stayed focused on the district's mission to provide a personalized academic program for our students and on the vision of every learner future ready with key aspects of that vision, including utilizing technology to optimize learning and leverage innovation. The, vision, the, the mission and vision were the foundation of the technology planning committee's uh, work. So there's our committee's goal. Thanks, Lori. Mm -hmm. So the keeping the vision really at the center of everything that we were doing as a team, I can tell you I'm so proud of the work of this group. Collective Commitments is really the name of this particular slide. Uh, we had over 70 committee members who represented um, all the way from the staff that you see here pre-K through 12, as well as administration, parents, and really our students were a heart of a lot of the conversation. One of our evenings, we had six um, sessions, which all lasted between three and four hour, hours in the evening. And one of our evenings, we had um, about 10 to a dozen of our um, high school students as the heartbeat of really what we were trying to accomplish and brought voice on behalf of our entire student body of what their vision is and what their hopes are. And so that became the backdrop of the rest of our meetings is keeping our students' voice at the center of our work. So in the end, we landed on a draft and you have uh, one of those final drafts, which 
I always say as an English teacher, it's never done. You know, the, the work always continues in and out, drafting in and out. But uh, we had um, an ongoing uh, drafting process, which started with a really, really rough draft, literally markers and poster to what you see tonight, and ha gave every committee member, including students, an opportunity to give us feedback on that draft. So what you're going to see and what, you're gonna, what we're going to talk about this evening is a comprehensive plan. And there's some prefacing work around that comprehensive plan, but we're going to zoom in on four commitment areas and what we've committed to as a, as a committee. So I'm going to hand it over to Nick, who's going to launch us into that commitment and uh, what those four commitments are, as well as into the first commitment area. Thanks, Noreen. So as you can see here, our four commitment areas are listed. Uh, and the first two uh, are a little bit larger than the others, and we think that's uh, pretty important uh, because all of the work that we do uh, is built off of these two uh, goal areas, which uh, would be clear student learning outcomes. Everything we do is rooted and grounded in serving our students uh, and allowing them to have uh, the ability to flourish and uh, become future ready. Uh, with that, we also acknowledge that it's, it's equally important to have clear learning outcomes for our staff. Uh, for our, our professionals who are working with our students and moving them through the learning progressions. So uh, it's helpful to think about this as a learning plan. Uh, it's not just a, a dry, lifeless plan that we're giving you, uh, but it's a, a living, breathing, uh, purposeful uh, plan for learning and how we're going to move our students forward uh, throughout uh, the next several years. Additionally, in addition to those first two very important areas uh, would be access, access to resources. The committee uh, in our discussion uh, believed that uh, it was important to focus on how we uh, do the work uh, that we need to do. So not just establishing uh, the work that we hope is done, but how we're going to get there. Uh, so the access piece is pretty critical to, uh, to accomplishing that goal. And finally, a, robu a robust infrastructure uh, for a data-driven system. Uh, we don't just want to uh, go into this blindly, but we really wanted to make sure we had a, a well-thought-out, well-crafted plan that um, focused on uh, tools for learning. So this is a nice graphic that uh, kind of encapsulates what our, our hope is. Um, a favorite quote of mine is always, you know, teachers are never going to be replaced by technology. but Teachers who know how to replace, to, to use technology will replace those who don't. So how do we use technology as a leverage point? How do we uh, leverage technology access, uh, the tools that we have available to our students, uh, in order to provide a robust uh, learning environment so that every student is able to be future ready? And we're not just going to launch kids off into the air. We're, this, is, this, is an, this is a gentle uh, leverage point. Risk management for might have an issue with this. <laughs> So uh, talking about that first um, commitment uh, around student learning, uh, we wanted to uh, begin with kids because kids are what we're all about. So uh, a goal area there, as you can see highlighted in blue, uh, would be that all students, all learners, uh, will have an engaging and empowering learning experience in both formal and informal settings that prepare them to be active, creative, knowledgeable, and ethical participant, uh, participants in our globally connected society. Each uh, point there uh, is equally important, and, and this digital literacy piece uh, in the graphic that you see, every element of that is important for our students as they um, move and, and grow in our system uh, between critical thinking and evaluation, uh, creativity, uh, being able to be proficient in communication. All of these pieces are key components to help our students be uh, digital learners and, and to be successful. So within that realm of student learning, uh, we established some, some outcomes that we're hopeful uh, for. And you can see those uh, listed here. Uh, but what it got a lot of the educators in the room excited uh, was a clear, uh, I guess, learning outcome by grade level bands. So establishing what students should know uh, by the end of each grade level. So what do we expect our kindergartners to know and be able to do with technology? What do we expect our uh, middle school students to know and be able to do uh, in regards to using technology? So making sure that we have really clear, uh, clearly defined roles for our students and how they use technology in the classroom and in their learning. Uh, in addition to that, uh, would be establishing metrics to assess those learning outcomes. So uh, not just putting those out there, but being able to assess and see how students are progressing uh, as they grow. 
uh, embedding future ready learning uh, within every content area. We know uh, that digital uh, learning does not just uh, live in isolation to uh, literacy or math, but we can use it across disciplines. Um, and making sure that we provide direct instruction to all students uh, in terms of how they use the resources uh, so that they are uh, the most meaningful and useful to our kids. I'll hand it off to Lori now. Thank you. Um, as we continue to build on our national education technology plan and identify our cycle of learning, another important group to include are our educators. The high level view of this goal would be to effectively support our teachers by providing access to technology and access to time that allows them to connect to future ready educational assets. So how do we do this? It's really a four step process that begins with our students. We identify clear learning outcomes, as was mentioned, at grade levels. What's the expectation of the student and what do they need to be learning? And then we provide opportunities for our teachers to improve their instruction to meet those outcomes. We set the expectation of digital use of core systems and include instruction and access to training on those systems. The staff will use the existing PLC meetings to identify ways to integrate technology into their curriculum. So let me give you an example, paint a picture of what this commitment looks like from our staff and our students. Let's say that we determine that students should be proficient with using a keyboard and a mouse by the time they leave elementary school. That would be identifying a clear outcome. And then let's say we determine there's a new software that would help students to learn about using that keyboard and mouse. This software would be chosen and agreed upon that all were using this to teach students that if you were using to teach a keyboard and a mouse, <laughs> this is the system you would use. Teachers would be trained on that system so they can provide the best possible learning that that system has to offer. And we commit to the time teachers need to learn that system. And then finally, teachers would review their current curriculum to see where they can insert that new technology. Maybe students are doing a research project and rather than students writing an assignment in elementary school, they would be typing their assignments. To summarize, this model ensures the commitment of our professional learning that they're met and that they're both efficient and effective. Critical Commitment 3 is about access to resources. Being able to provide constant and widespread access to internet and to devices both in and out of school. The committee spent quite a bit of time talking about access to resources. Part of access is also about having access to high quality digital learning content. In our district, we're fortunate to have access to Grantwood AEA databases, but there's the possibility of other resources that teacher librarians could explore for the district to provide high quality digital content to our students and also the work that we're doing with open education resources. Part of access is also reviewing our board policies for responsible and acceptable use of those devices and ensuring that those are taught to our students. So how will we meet critical commitment number three, access? We will develop a plan to prepare for rollout and also for refreshing devices. We will be able to implement one-to-one -one devices 24-7 for our teaching staff. We will provide one-to-one -one mobile devices for our middle school and our high school students and provide two-to-one mobile devices for our elementary students. Part of our job will be to identify the specifications for those devices and also to come up with the orientation that's necessary for students and family in order to be successful with this, with this rollout. Again, 
creating and modifying any policies that need to exist for acceptable use, and also working with our community to be able to provide community-based Wi-Fi access for our students that don't have that access when they go home in the evening. We should just take pause to clap. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is awesome. So um, commitment four recognizes that the first three commitments require uh, sound foundational systems um, and infrastructure. So we're committed to expanding the network and the wireless capacity. We, um, we want to ensure the necessary support for students and staff to access and expand the use of digital resources for learning, whether that's equipment or um, online resources. And we want to provide both systems that are both easy to use, but still maintain the integrity of the, in the security of the data to protect student and staff data. Um, Noreen's going to talk about some data system needs. So I get a little excited about all of this. Um, Literally. That's good. That, that's not a we'll forced. I know that's not a forced jump up and down. But I think about um, if we think about critical commitment number one, which is students at the center of all decisions that we make. We have to equip our staff to be able to do that. And I was in a meeting recently um, with a, a group of teachers working really, really hard in a PLC, and it's something as simple as they couldn't within the PLC, like they're sitting in a circle, someone had to leave the circle to go access the desktop that was across the room in order to project something. And it may sound simple, but when you're trying to create collaborative environments, space and time and geography matter. And so eliminating barriers to our teachers who may not have a technology tool at home that they can just take with them and access. They need the support to be able to deliver on the promise for all children. And so one and two work together. The data system though, our teachers, instead of crunching numbers, they need it done for them and put in, they put in the hard work for the planning. They put in the hard work for the assessment. Now let's process that in a way which you get expedited information to make decisions for children. And so I'm super jacked up about this piece. Sorry. Yeah. Laurel, let's get that in the minutes. Yeah. Noreen yeah, is up. jacked up. <laughs> The graphic on the screen, I, you can read all the bullets, but just picture for a moment that primary rectangle there. In our current system, we have an idea. All, the, all of those uh, pieces of data are coming from separate parts of our system, and they're going out separately. We don't have a way to bring it all together. And we've talked about this several times this year in the board work sessions, uh, how to bring that information together. So we are committed to a comprehensive plan that serves a, a one-stop shop for our teachers, a one-stop shop for our children, a one-stop shop for our families, so they can access information and make great decisions, and that you all as a board also get that contextualized one-stop shop too. So that means that we may have to change some of the uh, current state um, software, whether it be software or whatever it is that we're, we're choosing to use, so that we get access, data access, to make great decisions for kids every day. It shouldn't take three days for teachers to get information back on children, and it shouldn't take six months. Uh, they deserve better access, and our kids deserve better access. So we are studying this, and we're committed to making a comprehensive plan of a really great student information system that delivers for kids, whether that be an upgrade or something different, a data system that is married to that student information system, and then a visualization process where it's not just numbers, but it makes information readily available for, for everybody. So that is, um, that is awesome. I'm jacked up now, I tell you. This is going to be awesome. This is a work session, you guys, so if you have questions. This district, I think, has been working on that warehousing of data for 
a long time uh, before your time, back when I was working in the district. And we seem to run into some, some problems matching with AEA. I think at one time the concern was our systems didn't match up with AEA and they wouldn't talk to each other and so mm -hmm. on. Right. And then there was a discussion of the cost of being able to, to, to create, we're talking about millions of dollars in order to create the, the warehouse. So I, I'm, not, I'm not a naysayer. I, I, we always, I see the purpose. I know the purpose. I just hope we're able to, at this point, we're able to move forward and actually do it because uh, as you say, it's just at this time in technology when we don't have the capacity to be able to do what we should be able to do is just, it's a shame and it will greatly help uh, the teachers and keep us from reinventing the wheel and reproducing information and so on. Data is, uh, the result is, is the key as we move forward, so. You know, I, I, so I can, uh, only echo everything that you just said and part of the uh, I always say uh, a tool can certainly be helpful but a tool without vision means nothing Lori said something great earlier today and she said you know when you're building a house you don't say it's a hammer plan right <laughs> you say it's a house plan and so we're not creating a technology plan we're creating a, a, a learning plan for kids and so but this but a hammer matters, right? It's an important tool in order to build the house. And so we recognize that a clear data system is going to help us move forward. So the good news is things have improved from 10 years ago, but also these conversations are happening at the AEA too. And there's some infrastructural changes that are happening at the AEA as well, um, and broadening their scope of a matter of how to serve us, because that's their purpose, is to serve schools. And our purpose is to help serve kids and teachers. Um, so we need to, we're all talking the same talk now, but I think that we have better resources now than maybe we did even five years ago. So it's a good thing. Thank you for the update. You're welcome. So uh, four C's, here we are. The last piece is our 21st century skills that happen. Um, the four C's being collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking as being the anchor of those major competencies we're trying to keep track of for our students. Digital literacy has to be a prominent part of all of that for future ready learning. Wherever our kids go, they're going to experience this. So making them responsible citizens, but also making them critical thinkers for their future, we have to prepare them for it. So finally, this all loops back together of what we've discussed all year long around a profile of a graduate. So as our children leave us, we are preparing them for the world in front of them. And this technology plan, which I love that this team, we've, we all coined the phrase, it's a learning plan. This is a learning plan to deliver on the promise of every, every learner to be future ready. So we're super excited about it. You have lots of details in front of you with the plan. So we are open to questions and I want to certainly answer those, but thank you for the questions along the way during our presentation. So we are wide open for feedback and questions. Yeah, Jennifer. Yes, I have a few. First of all, awesome. Thank you. I think this is great. Thanks for all of your hard work. Go team. Go team. Go team. So um, I, uh, I have a question about what will be done to establish those metrics that are going to be used to access student outcomes. So sure. what does that mean? So uh, we are... Um, you also saw in the technology plan, there are, there are metrics that already exist on the national lens with the ISTE standards. Mm -hmm. And so we are going to start there. We are not going to recreate the wheel, and those are very committed to the state of Iowa as well. And they also align with the 21st century skills with the state of Iowa too. So we intend to unpack those uh, with our teams of teachers and see where they best align. I think initially we're going to need um, district level leadership that includes teacher leadership and administration to take a look at that scope probably members of our committee, and then make a plan to move forward of how we integrate that into the curriculum. I love how Lori highlighted that specific example about a keyboard. I would hate to tell an elementary principal, this is where you're going to have to do this and how, but identifying those outcomes just like we do with all of our other learning outcomes, and then really getting input from our teachers about where that might embed in the curriculum. 
And so kind of building on that and also building on what Lori said about how to how to teach the keyboard. So to me, it sounds like there's going to be some um, some shared language maybe there. So we have kind of some a yes. tighter yeah. around data analytics. So yes. So uh, beginning with the end in mind, helping our teachers gain skill sets too means that they are probably going to need access before kids. Sure. So that would be the first step is getting teachers the tools in their hands of what they need. But then also um, there's a lot of research around digital literacy with professional development. Development. The more we can make it job embedded and not sit and get, the more likely it is that it's sustainable. And so that is our hope. We can see that in our blended learning schools, our prime example. They've done some learning, but really the learning's happened in their PLCs and implementation around student learning. So those would be models within our very own system that we will learn from and uh, use to carry forward. But I said this to the principals last week, what did I say about digital li literacy? Who? Yeah, it's on that. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to build the capacity of our building leaders. Uh, this can't, it can't be um, that you're the digital literacy trainers and I have to wait for you to come to my building. I have to build my own capacity as a leader to sustain it within my building too, which means time in my building, committing that uh, within the only, my own professional development as a building leader too. So what kind of leadership role were like IDS take in any of the yeah. technology? So that's another layer. So we've got the vision of the, of the building administrators, but then we have this whole other layer, layer of teacher leadership. Right. So scaling up their um, work as well. So some of the conversations that Lori and I've had, for example, with Carla Reese and her department, curriculum and instruction assessment, have maybe talked about the open access resources or the OE resources, but not necessarily about leading the standards around digital literacy. So this will become more comprehensive. So if it feels like we talk about digital literacy all the time wherever people are turning and going that's the intent to make it that pronounced so are we going to be asking for IDS to do more are we increasing a workload or is something going to be shifted so you have to think about it as replacement behaviors so instead of me doing something on paper I'm going to be doing it digitally okay. instead okay yep okay, you need to go to the microphone yep awesome just Somebody will watch this later and go, I didn't hear the question, so. So your, your question, oh no, I've forgotten it. It's because about I IDS? It. <laughs> I'm sorry. IDS I and, um, <coughs> Layered work or replacement work? Yes, thank you. So would you agree that part of the, the expense of the IDS is answering questions and supporting staff for those systems? where what we have seen and what we have heard is that some of the rollout of those systems um, has maybe been minimal to what we are proposing. And so when a new system or a, a learning management system or a, anything that comes software, the first step is to have, like Noreen suggested, our teachers on board with it. They know it, they understand it. And so you're spending the money in the front end so that you're not spending it in the back end. So it's kind of a balance that IDS time would go down because your teachers are able to answer more of those questions because they've been trained on those systems properly. An additional piece that might be helpful is there is a run up on this. We have 19 of our schools in pilot work on blended learning. So we have lots of activity in elementary schools right now that are uh, engaging in sort of mucking through uh, what the implementation of this type of thing looks like in classrooms and there's some pretty exciting results out of some of our schools related to those pilots. So. I think it's also important to remember that digital literacy is a skill set but it's also tools and so anytime you have digital literacy embedded into your instructional practices or into your learning it's just tools to help you uh, grow in that area and so um, so sometimes you have to teach how to use the tool and other times you just have to use the tool for a different purpose. There questions? Gary? Um, well, one, I love the, the plan. I love the idea that it's, you know, it's, it's um, revolved around learning. And as Lori just said, you know, the technology is just a tool. And it's, uh, it's how, what, what do you do with the tool and how to use it. And I think as we're learning, there could be both good uses and there could be bad uses. And so as part of the learning and as we teach and work with, with students, 
we also need to incorporate appropriately and right and, and so on. But my question is funding. When we start talking about the 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 one-on-one, -on -one, the middle school and high school, um, it could be a sizable expense. Where do we have a revenue uh, uh, stream in mind? Can that come out of Pebble? Yes, time, and I just talked about replacement time. It's that too. <laughs> so we're talking about replacement of how we're spending our funds. Um, so um, in regards to the one-to-one -one devices, that's really right now a save expense. So instead of buying desktops, we're going to be buying laptops. Um, there's been a lot of um, opportunity for choice in some regards. Uh, say, for example, as a principal, you can choose perhaps maybe what kind of device you might want. We might have a little less choice when you're tr trying to provide for all when you look at a one-to-one -one option and so looking at um, uh, I'll just use surfaces as an example they're pretty expensive that would not be a tool we'll be able to afford for a one-to-one -one environment so one it's choice about what the tool is but two it's about replacement of um, what we're currently spending some funds on and directing it towards a very clear vision and so therefore there might have to be i call it lane tapping <laughs> got to tap people in the lane a little bit they may really want some other things what we're directing funds towards will be towards this common vision if a building or a team wants something different that's really going to have to come out of a building decision so we will be directing that work as a team as devices as what we recommend for the devices and so that will be part of the plan to fund it professional development will be out of current professional development funds it's just a lot of our funds are going to be focused on this thank you yep so that's one thing I was going to mention as well. So, you know, what would be the p potential risks? So one of them being financially, you know, where would this come from? Um, other risks would be, and, you know, the key would be get in front of those things would be, is our network ready and protected? Do we have firewalls? Do we have, have VPN? Um, do, are we going to have authentication for these devices? Is there going to be, you know, protection so that if one of these devices is lost or stolen and somebody use it for hacking purposes or whatnot, um, and how do we teach kids as well as staff on what to do with those things to make sure that we're addressing that before it becomes a problem? And so Lori can probably speak more to the infrastructure pieces, but that is part of the next uh, 18 months is really assessing and making sure that our, our network is ready from a technical point of view. I can speak from experience on the latter part of your question. So a lot of this is front loading and helping everyone understand. One thing that we're keenly interested in is around the assessment process and student outcomes. Some of those student outcomes are, all, are about responsibility and citizenship. And these devices belong to the school, but they're going to be issued to students. So with that comes some very clear strategies. We are the benefactor of a state that more schools are one-to-one -one than are not now. So we will be learning from our collaborative community. There's a great one-to-one -one conference every year in our state, um, ISTE conference. There's lots of folks that we can learn from. Our AEA has supported countless districts that have gone this direction. So there are contracts that we will have with kids and families that will outline what the expectations are that fit Cedar Rapids. But in addition to that, we would be looking at some competencies and perhaps maybe kids, you've got to earn a badge in order to get your device in order to take it home. Uh, I've done that with middle schoolers, worked really, really great. So it was really about four to six weeks into the school year. We had a structure and a way that they understood what it meant to be responsible for this device, and then they got to take it home. So we'll need to spend the next 18 months making sure those kinds of things are in place. Right, and I, I saw that in the timeline, and that was awesome. I mean, as a board, I think we've all at some point or another during a work session talked about one-to-one -one and what type of benefit this would provide for all students and staff. But then also as a parent, I can imagine, you know, a parent using this, uh, you were kind of talking earlier, you know, if they can graphically look and use a separate pin or log in and see where their student is trending and, you know, what their scores are for something. So that, yeah, that's exciting. Lori, the story the other day, so my son is part of a one-on-one environment, and I get every um, 
Sunday it was somewhere between two and four o'clock in the morning. I'm not sure why that comes in my inbox at that point in time. But every Monday morning I can look and sure enough, I have my son's report and I see exactly where he's been, what he's been looking at, what he's been doing and how he's been spending his time on his computer. And to me as a parent, I, he's doing a little too much college searching. I know you might not think that's possible, but it's awesome. true. I'd like to see more time on AP Lit right now. Um, but uh, anyway, a lot of time in his college searches right now. So that's really great information for me as a parent. I, I could see eventually, you know, even some parents being intrigued or curious at the device and trying to use it on their own. So I could even see the potential for some type of orientation program for parents. And I think that was included in the plan, too, to address that. So that's... It's awesome. I'll speak a little bit about the infrastructure question. So the last several years we have had um, expanded access to E-rate and so we've been doing things like replacing our firewalls with the vision that we would be going one to one. So we, we are pretty well set there, but those systems do need to be replaced every five to seven years. And with our wireless, we um, have the ability to continue to add more access points, which are needed as more devices come onto the network. So um, those things we have uh, anticipated. Jennifer? Oh. Sure. I think there's one, and I'm gonna put my parent hat on now. I have two students at Kennedy High School right now. I think there's another key, and we didn't, they were part of our technology team, our parents were, but I think there's also a really important factor to, to keep in mind when you have a one-to-one -one device that goes home, you immediately open the door for parents to be involved in what their students are doing. And I hear time and time again from our staff how important and how critical our students need their parents to be involved. And by having a computer, you take that, that, that brick wall away. And then you also provide them with not just the means to do it, but the systems that are understandable for them to do it. And a communication for the student and the parent to connect um, about who the student is and what they're doing. And, and being able to see that real time um, for some of our families that don't have uh, those computers, that makes a big difference, getting to have them on board to collaborate, to support our education, to support our teachers, but ultimately to support our students. So. Thanks for that. And I mean, I, I kind of envision multi-language support. So, you know, we look at some of our families that are, you know, not native speakers and suddenly they can hit something and switch to another language. Absolutely, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Oh. For your hard work and I'm le really looking forward to updates this is pretty exciting so thank you for what you've done so far Jennifer yeah I had an additional question about funding I know that systems need to be kind of refreshed and replaced every five to seven years does that hold too also for hardware so is it our laptops or um, surface pros or, or whatever are they also needing to be replaced every five years so are we looking at kind of a because it's a pretty compressed timeline for rollout. So are we looking at kind of like every five years we're going to have two years of, of a larger expenditure in this area and so then three years of kind of a break and then two more years? So uh, back in systems, five to seven years, mobile devices more like three to four okay. years. Um, so we have anticipated that. Um, device costs have come down. So significantly and the fact that a lot of our resources are web-based have um, changed the nature of the specs that are needed for devices so um, between the combination of the lower cost devices available and the type of use of those devices um, a three-year refresh um, for those would be doable in our uh, current save funding Okay, but it, it will be it won't be spread out over three years. It's not going to be a consistent cost every year for those three years. It'll be an increased cost we, in this line item once every three years. Um, I'll, I'll give a possible example: is that once we get one to one in place, that every year we would be providing ninth graders with a device as they okay. enter high school, and it would they would use so it until their twelfth grade. Okay. And at sixth grade, we would give them a device that they would use through their middle school years. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions? What, what, what do you need from us as the board? I mean, we've been looking at this vision for a long time. And uh, 
you know, we're going to the Capitol and we're advocating for funding and all of those things. Um, connectivity in the community. I know Dr. Buck and others have started to have some of those conversations as well. What, what else do you need from us to do? Well, thank you for recognizing that funding is always a, a limiting factor for us. Um, and our community um, conversations about how can we support our students' use outside of the school walls for connectivity because um, that is a great digital divide that needs to um, be taken care of for those students that need that extra um, access outside that currently don't have it. Okay. I would just agree that um, it's the big picture of what all of our kids need for access to be future ready. And so in regards to what you can do to support, it's. Um, it's the constant one note that we're about access for all kids. And when all kids don't get what they need, it's really hard for us to provide. So it is. it does come down to a lot of funding and advocacy. And I appreciate um, your willingness and commitment to uh, advocate on the Hill. <laughs> because that's where it will happen, is we do need all kids to have access. Yeah. Equity. Absolutely. Well, and, and we do have it, I think, as part of Dr. Buck's standards of uh, his uh, measures of performance, I think. Don't we have that in there? Something about the technology plan and success, yeah. I think, yeah. You could check that. No yeah. pressure. No pressure. <laughs> the, um, so the safe, the safe conversation is, here's an additional reason why the safe extension is important, because uh, this is going to be a need uh, well beyond 2029, so, yeah. I think on behalf of the whole board, we want to thank all of you and all the committee members that have put all this time and effort into this and we have some committee members here if oh awesome yeah thank you all members. oh yeah. awesome yeah thanks for all your work on this yes thank you all right thanks all right with that um, the board um, is going to move into an exempt meeting to discuss um, strategy uh, of the union and non-union employee groups. Uh, so with that, of the board, uh, you have your calendar, you have um, your board feedback plus Delta forms, if you could do those. And the meeting is adjourned. We'll move into an exempt meeting. Thank you.